Hi, we're Diane and Keith Morris from Integrity Automotive. And we support TV 18 and love life around the lake. Hi, Norm Allen with you here from TV 18, Life Around the Lake. All of you who have been donating and helping us with our cause here to keep Project 18 and TV 18 going, I want you to know how much we appreciate that. I also want to remind you that any of you who would like to participate in it, you may do so by making your checks out to Flow, Friends of Lake of the Woods, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and you get a tax deduction for all of your donations. You're the reason we're on the air. You're the reason it works, because at TV 18, Life Around the Lake, the stories are all about you. Hi, I'm Janet Ayers and Jim Steele from the General's Quarters Restaurant in the Locust Grove Town Center. And we proudly support TV 18 and we love life around the lake. Welcome back to Art for Life. I'm your host Pete Brown and where we left off was we finished a, a kind of a sketch of some sunflowers. Today, uh, the, for the rest of this session, we're going to begin the process of building a studio painting. So the process of composition and the process of doing it. First we start with what we want to do. One of the things near and dear to me, I grew up on, a, on the water. My dad was a fisherman, but also we were surrounded by farmland. And old barns are a subject that are just kind of nice. My last house in North Carolina was a dairy farm behind us, and they had a lot of barns, silos, etc. So that's a subject I like. It's boats and barns more often than not. What I do first in the process is called a thumbnail sketch. Now, this isn't going to be very visible to you. It's not detail. It is simply trying to lay out the format of what we want to paint. We draw it several ways, maybe a vertical format, a horizontal format, or a square format. In this case, I've chosen to use a horizontal format, and I've done a very brief thumbnail sketch. Again, it's just blurred, but I have jumped ahead and transferred that to the canvas. So for this, then the next thing I would do, typically, is do a, a little uh, color sketch to pick a palette in which, by which to do it. So it's the same type of process, just adding some color um, to pick out the colors I want to use. So for this one, this is what I've decided on my format. I've, I've simply sketched this in with some charcoal, vine charcoal, over a gessoed canvas. This is uh, white and gray, uh, gray gesso. Gesso is simply a, a chalk-like carbon, uh, carbon product to fill in the weave of the canvas, uh, to kill the white. So I've, I mix some black into it to make it gray so I'm not fighting the white. I will put some various tones now. I can tone the whole thing or I can simply begin my underpainting. So my underpainting here is going to be the, the first thing we'll do. What I've done in my design, however, in composition, the rule of thirds again, divide the canvas this way, this way, this way, this way. Three pieces up and down and the hot spots are where those lines intersect. In this case, this barn, a man-made structure, will always become your subject in a landscape. I want the most color and contrast here. Um, you know, that's why I want to draw your eye there. In the foreground here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six bands in this particular landscape. What I want to do is make these recede. In the foreground, as you enter this piece, I want this to be something we can just kind of look at and over to guide you in. Back here is just to break up the line and to give us, create some depth. I've got the silos behind this hillock here. Um, I may make this a road or I may just make it a field. I may put some fence posts, not sure yet. Back here, this is right in front of our subject. That'll be a different layer. And then behind our subject, I'll want something dark. So I'm going to make that like a mountainous, hilly area. I may throw a tree in or something, and of course our sky. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six bands in this particular painting. Within those bands will vary the color, will vary the rhythms, will, and, and just to create interest. What we're not going to do at this point is paint this barn first. 
The last thing we'll do is that. I'm going to sketch it now with some paint so you can see it, where I'm going to place things, and we'll begin that way. Um, so our first order of business is to kind of lay in. I may tone this canvas as I go, so I may use some colors that are going to seem counterintuitive. What I want to have are complementary colors underneath uh, the colors, I, the, my final colors. If I want to paint grass, I don't start painting green. I've got to have something under it. I've got to have some violets or some reds under the grass to make it show up and sparkle. So I'm going to begin always in the back part. I'm going to try to mix a little quick sky color. First I'm going to put a little orange under that so I get something that's kind of, it's going to be a little garish here. It's going to, it's going to shock even me, but we want something under there that'll make the, uh, that'll make the That'll make the blue shine. So I'm going to put some orange in there. Oh my goodness. Let's do that with a paper towel. So paper towel, orangish color. So when I put the blue over it, it'll look better because it'll have the complement under it to make it sparkle. If you put two complementary colors together, the Impressionists did that. They did not use any blacks on their canvas. They simply used complementary colors to create the images. A red next to a green will make a brown. A blue next to a yellow, your eye will see a green even if they're not mixed together. So side-by-side -side colors for the Impressionist created their volume, their depth, their everything. That's all they did. So I'm toning this right now with a paper towel to get some orangish color under this blue. So when I put a sky in there, It'll, it'll have some sparkle to it because the complement will show through under the blue. Each layer we put on the canvas we want to use, we want to create excitement, we want to set ourselves up for the next pass. So we always think about each layer we put on is simply um, setting ourselves up for the next layer. So in this case this ugly orange is going to make a pretty blue sky. You'll notice too I've, I've kind of enhanced it over here. It's a different layer of color than here. So I want some shift in my sky. I don't want it to be the same all the way across. It'll be darker on one side or cooler or warmer, if you will, across the way. Okay, so we got that going on. Let's uh, bring that sky down a hair behind here and just in case we'll fade it in here. So that is my basic layout for my sky. When that dries, it'll go blue. In the very background now, I've got to have something behind my subject. And it'll ultimately be greenish, darkish. But for right now, I'm going to put a, I don't know, some, some umberish colors, maybe a hint of violet in it, um, just to kind of underpaint that. So when I put, this makes no sense to you right now probably, but hopefully it will when I'm done. So we want to get some underpainting in there, some earth tones, something that'll enhance whatever greenish type things I put in it. We're going to go to a bigger brush. Bigger brush is always better. Use the largest brush you can. When I first started painting, everything was about detail to me. I had a brush that maybe had one hair in it and I would try to paint everything with that. Um, the most boring paintings you can make uh, end up being that, that's a good way to start them. There are three things that, that a painting can be about. It can be any of the two, but it can't be all three. I like the acronym uh, my old teacher taught me, CIA. It's either about color or information or application. It can be about any of the two, but it can't be about all three. What I mean by that is if it's about color, well that's self-explanatory. Pretty colors excite people. Value does all the work, does all the heavy lifting, but color gets all of the credit. If the value is correct in a painting, it will work, no matter what color you put on it. If the value is incorrect, you can't put enough good painting on it to make it work. So color, information, or application. So color is self-explanatory. Good colors working with good values will work. Information is about detail, a lot of detail. When I first started painting, I did tall ships. Every little line was drawn. Very boring paintings. 
So the looser you can get it, the more interest you create. When this painting is done, the only area of detail or most color and contrast is going to be around this barn shape. Um, so this one is going to be about color and application, not so much information. I don't need a lot of detail to suggest to you that that is a barn when I'm done with it. When I lay it in, the shape of it will say, oh, a barn. If I make it interesting through color and application of paint, then it'll work. So color, information, or application. Application simply means how did you put the paint on. When it's all said and done, the subject of any painting is simply the paint. It's not the barn, it's not the flowers, it's the paint. How did you handle the paint? And that's what I hope you'll learn as we go through this process. We're not copying photographs. We can't outdraw a camera no matter how hard we try, but we can create more interest than a camera can if we use the paint properly. So that's what we're trying to learn through this series. So, all right, we got some dark behind our subject now, and that'll work for us. Again, no big detail, nothing here. Let's get some uh, underpainting now on these bands of color. But what about, what about the, the barn? It'll be there. I'm not worrying about the barn yet. We all want to get the barn first. Uh, we, have to, we don't build a house starting with the roof. We have to get the foundation. We've got to get something in there to build it on. So we're going to just push colors in here. This will eventually be grass right here, I think, if we so desire. Um, it could turn into something else. But we're going to just get ourselves started. In our first undercoating, all we're doing is toning the canvas. We want to get everything covered, um, laying in some tones and some values within these bands. So when we come back in a moment to these other bands, we get these laid in. We've got these six bands of color that we're going to, or, or six bands of major shapes, puzzle pieces if you will. We're just trying to say this is how this thing is going to lay out. All right, and now we're going to need this one and then this one. In this foreground, I'm going to go a little bit lighter. In the early days of painting, the early painters always worked extremely dark in the foreground to create the depth by fading into the distance. We kind of want to do that, but the reality is if you're standing on the ground looking at a landscape, the area in front of you is actually kind of light. So as we set up our values, um, this sky will be the number one value or the lightest. The foreground area, this puzzle piece, will be number two. Uh, number three will be here. This one will be uh, four. Or maybe this will be four. This will be five. And this six will be our darkest. We want our darkest area behind the subject to kind of anchor and hold it. Um, all right, so we're just scrubbing in here. This is the process. This is the boring part, but it's a necessary part. No detail in any of this. It's just you can't tell it, that it's anything in particular other than a mass of color and a puzzle piece shape. So we want it to color it in like that. Okay, so we got some difference here in, in value. Uh, we'll put something over here, uh, a little more. Again, we're just toning this stuff now. Uh, let's make it a little darker here with some darker color. The other thing uh, in, uh, on your palette, uh, we'll talk more about color as we go, but I don't use black out of a tube. I think I may have mentioned that in a, one of our earlier sessions. I like to mix the black out of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. The, the, the reason for that and the reason for a limited palette is that we want color harmony throughout our paintings. If we grab, they make a color for anything you can imagine, tubes of paint. If you grab 28 tubes of paint, you may have every color you want, but if you put them on a canvas, they're not going to be harmonious. They're going to look garish and, and, and fight each other. So if you can use a limited palette, uh, as we said on an earlier show, a warm and a cool color a version of each primary to form your secondaries, and then um, wherever possible, a few earth tones such as these to blend into those colors to gray them out and dull them out. All right, so we've got our, our things there. Oh my, what about our barn? What about our barn? All right, 
Let's lay in our barn. We've got to have our barn. So we know what we're doing here. So here's our barn. There goes one shape. There goes one. There's something under here. It's going to be very dark. I'm going to put one of these little, um, little uh, overhangs on that barn probably. So this will just really be dark up under there. We won't know what's in there because it's all going to be shadowed out. Uh, we'll lose it over here somewhere because that's where the barn loses. Uh, some things here, etc. We'll throw some, we'll make a grayish barn color because heck it's just an old, and that barn may be red, it may be black, we don't know yet. What are we, whatever we want it to be when we get there. For right now, we're just saying this is where it's going and then this coming out this way, even more pronounced. So we know where to put the paint later. That's our target. Um, I guess we better put some things to that silo as well. We're just so we know where it's going. It'll be kind of a, a dull grayish, blackish thing. It actually should go that way. We we'll always want to be mindful of our brush strokes because they give us information. They tell us, they give us information. So this thing is rounded, but we're looking at it from down below kind of, so we need to make sure our strokes run in that direction. Uh, having that gray background under there made this a little bit easier. So I'm just going to run them that way. Again, I'm just laying these in now, getting our shapes in, because we want to know where to put the paint in the, in the second layers. Right now, we're just setting ourselves up for the next layer. So we're going to put it here, a little more there. And it looks like we got a big old hole behind our a silo there, so we're going to have to put something back in there. Uh, we can go with the dark, I guess, we had, or we'll do something else. Uh, if we decide to put our light that way, all right, so we'll lose it. So that is our underpainting for this one. I'm going to set up now to begin the second layer as this dries. Again, this is acrylic paint, which um, dries very rapidly, so we'll be ready to go in just a moment. Okay, uh, welcome back to Art for Life. Now, we're several shows into this series that we'll explore painting, building a studio painting. We just did an underpainting for a landscape we'll do starting with our next session. But we've run down the road a long ways, and I haven't even told you what you might need to paint if you're just starting. So let's start uh, with the beginning of that. First, you should have a color wheel. You can download one off the internet or simply buy one of these. Again, this is very helpful when you're trying to figure out your color combinations. Red, blue, yellow is the primaries. Uh, Complements straight across from the color wheel. These are very useful. If I want a duller red, I put a little green. If I need to make a grayish violet, uh, I'll put a little yellow into the violet. Very helpful to have, particularly when you're starting out. It becomes very instinctive once you've been painting for a while. So uh, buy one or download it from the internet. Um, paints, uh, two, th two versions, oil or acrylic. Now, if you're working in watercolor, you're going to work opposite of what I'm teaching here. I'm teaching uh, acrylic and oil. I'm working with acrylics in this series because they dry quickly. If I'm working in oil, my process is the same. The difference is simply this. If I'm uh, using acrylic paints, I will thin that with acrylic medium, which is basically a, a water-based product, plastic, or I'll thin it with a little water. Uh, I can dab a paper towel in water into the paint, do these sorts of backgrounds. If I'm working in oil, I use odorless mineral spirits or turpentine. Most people prefer odorless mineral spirits because there's less smell with it. So the process is the same, underpainting, etc. Oil paints take longer to dry. You might have to wait a couple of days between each layer, um, whereas acrylic in an hour or 10 minutes sometimes you're ready for the next layer. With our paints we want to always have, as we mentioned in an earlier version, a warm and color, a warm and cool version of each color. Uh, a, a cool blue, a warm blue, a cool yellow, a warm yellow, a, a, war a cool red, a warm red. And then our earth tones are raw sienna, burnt sienna, burnt umber. Uh, for earth tones can also calm down uh, a color right, a color right out of two. For brushes, I've got a million brushes here. Most often what I use in my oil paints are bristle brushes. 
I use these wide guys like this, chip brushes or these Richardson brushes. The bigger the brush, the better. Uh, you can use the corner of the brush and make a small stroke or you can use the whole thing and make a wide stroke. I do have chiseled edge brushes like this for detail. Uh, these are my bristle brushes. These are my um, oil, I mean my uh, synthetic brushes for acrylic. Use synthetic brushes if possible for acrylic. You can use bristle, but they will clog up and ruin quickly. Um, plastic, uh, liquid plastic is what you're painting with, so the, they work better with synthetics for, for our acrylic paint. The, the length of the bristles here, this one is called a flat. It, there are longer bristles. The shorter bristles are called brights. Um, for making fine lines and detail, uh, the chiseled edges of these brushes both work the same. I can do this way and make a line, that way and make a line, or I can pull it this way, etc. cetera. Uh, brights and that. There's, then there's another brush called a filbert. It's shaped like a filbert nut around the edges. And ideally, it also has a chiseled edge, but um, it is, makes rounded shapes. Um, the big wide brushes for our washes, for our lay-ins, bigger, wider is better. Okay, palette. What do we need for a palette? Well, there's a lot, myriad of things. On this particular stuff, for these acrylic paints I just stuck my hand in, I'm using cookie sheets. They're, the paint uh, sticks to them, but you can scrape it right off with your fingernail later. Once it dries, uh, what you want to do with acrylic paint, keep it moist, spray a little spritzer on it. So a cookie tray will work. Any kind of plastic that is not acrylic, polystyrene, old cafeteria trays, or you can buy fancier palettes. For our, um, they, they make a palette just for acrylics. Just, it's this, it's got a place in it, a pad for moisture. However, this is what I use for my oils. I have a piece of glass in there and keep my oils so they're sealed and don't dry out. So anything you can paint on. As far as practice painting, you can buy little pads of canvas paper. Uh, that's what this is, is a piece of canvas pad. You can take a piece of cardboard and gesso it. It's wonderful for practice. I use those all the time for practicing strokes, for trying to do things. Um, those work perfectly. Pieces of cardboard. Masonite is another product you can use. You can gesso in that and make full-fledged paintings or you can use them for practice. Anything that we paint on is called the support. For what I do most of my paintings now are these um, box canvases or, or um, they're called, um, I just drew, drew a blank on the word for those, the deep, deep sided canvases. Um, box canvases or gallery wrap. That's the word I was looking for. Um, the thinner canvases are, you typically have to frame. These, if you paint the edge black when you're done, you don't have to frame them. It's your choice. These cost twice as much as those, but there's no frame involved. Um, brushes, again, the wider the better. Um, you will get, so you have detailed brushes, maybe one or two little uh, fine brushes for one end or the other. Paints, uh, if you're using oils, you'll need good quality paints. Uh, you'll need, uh, but in the beginning, student grades work. All of these paints that you see here are student grade. Nothing real expensive. Uh, as you're learning, do that. For you more advanced painters, buy the best paints you can get, the most expensive, the best pigment. The light fastness, it holds its color. You put it down and it'll stay the same color. With acrylic, you do have a shading uh, difference of about two shades when you when you lay it down and pick it up. Palette knives. You need a good palette knife. I recommend this size, this style for mixing your paints. You can also paint with this, pick up the paint, make any shape you want. The larger ones for bigger masses. Smaller knives for detail, for cutting in or out. So that's our basic supply list um, for painting. I hope you'll get your supplies. I hope you'll Join in on painting. I hope you'll join us again for our next session of Art for Life, and I thank you for watching.
This is the crew from the Flower Cottage. We are excited to support TV18. We love life around the lake. This is Michael from Red, White, Blue and Brew, your neighborhood shop for beer, wine and cheese. We love TV18 and life around the lake.